Romania or somewhere in the in we share. And we'd like to uh, share with you some information uh, that we found out, uh, and we called it a kind of an experiment. Uh, the Fab Labs built in La roche sur in Vendée, in France, uh, called uh, Forge des Possibles, as well as the Fat Lab in the University of Sergi Pontoise in Gennevilliers, which is quite close to here, uh, are for us some experiments to find out what uh, education will be in two, in uh, 12,000, or what industry will be 10 years from now on. So uh, basically the Fat Lab uh, was uh, opened something like uh, a year, a bit 15 year months ago, and we had our first anniversary uh, in February. So uh, the Fat Lab, see, you have a huge university. Uh, it's big, uh, it's very serious, uh, it's concrete. Uh, we have something like 200 square meters available, which makes it a big fab lab. And the president of the university uh, said once that we are a kind of uh, educational UFO. Uh, meaning that inside this serious university opening a fab lab, which is a kind of bizarre thing to do. Uh, and anyone would expect that a fab lab, the university, would bring lots of students, lots of brilliant teachers, Lots of people who are part of their courses and would show up inside the university. And so it would be a kind of microenvironment centered into university. And things uh, happen that this is absolutely not the case. Uh, the Fab Lab that we open, the Fab Lab is something that is open to all. We've made it clear from the beginning of the inception. It doesn't need to be a place just for students or for teachers. It needs to be open to everyone. It needs to be open for all ages. It needs to be open for all social conditions. We need to make sure that anybody can show up. And we said we will open this fab lab only if this is the case. And you all know that within universities, uh, you need security. People sometimes are filtered. And to our great surprise, uh, it, this happens. That is, it's actually open to everyone. And the proof that we can give you is that our visitors are not students. We don't have so many students. We have people working, we have retired people, we have people looking for a job, we have people who are independent artists, designer, anyone you may want to find out. We even have kids, we have many kids showing up there. So the place itself, if you look at the period of ages, doesn't really fit with what you would expect to be happening within a French university. So. I'm not sure if everyone here knows what a fab lab is. So let's have a very quick review of some ideas and some pictures showing all what we actually do inside the fab lab. So I would like you just to make sure that you forget the fact that we are within a university and we suppose it to be a very serious place with teachers. That's not the case. So what do we do there? People who show up uh, in the fab lab simply create objects for everyday life. So this is a simple object, but if you have a look at it, uh, it was done with a laser cutter, it has been done with uh, uh, some tools to create plants, etc. etc. So it has been assembled, we found out many things about uh, materials, etc. Uh, etc. Et we also do things like gardening. Screen, uh, I don't know how that what that's called, but uh, there is some gardening behind the window, window gardening. And uh, it was uh, something that was started a few months ago and actually it works quite well and brings many people who are interested in finding out how you can do some internal gardening within a house or a place like university, which is interesting. People do more quote, quote, serious things. They prototype objects. So we have lots of visitors who show up and would like just to do something just for themselves. And this is a nice lamp, for example. So the technology behind it, same thing, uh, CAD and uh, a laser cutter on the assembling it and trying, failing, trying it again. Because when you are in a fab lab, what you are here to do is just not, is to be able to fail, is to be able to try again, because nobody is judging you. You're just doing things, enjoying it and sharing it. One of the deals of the fab lab is to be there, it's free as long as you tell other people what to do and how you do it so that they can do the same thing, improve on it, or find out what doesn't work because you did you failed before them. And they say, okay, I'm not going to do this again because this guy failed. 
this is a successful product. This is something that has been done through many iterations, but now we have a nice map. We have also students, some of them are showing up, but you also have people coming to hack things. Uh, I think they've been hacking a kind of uh, remote control car, so they took it apart, uh, they took the ra uh, radio control apart, and what they did is that they put an Arduino in it, and now the machine is autonomous. That is, whenever it bumps into a wall, it goes back, turns, etc., etc. This has been done in a few hours of work, and this is extremely satisfying to find this out. Some of the people show up and they try to embody an idea. So we have got architects, we've got people who simply have plans. They have ideas in their head, and they would like to make them concrete, to share them because they become concrete. So in a fab lab, you make things. So for example, plans. So that's not the huge, beautiful thing that we do in the fab lab in Barcelona, but that's a step. We have people who also work in uh, doing experiments. Uh, for example, someone worked with a small hexapod. If, I don't know if you know what an hexapod is. It's a small machine that just has six legs and walks like a spider. And this one was autonomous. It just walked in front of it. So it was totally hacked. And there was now there's a sensor that was put on it. There's a very small Arduino board put on it. And now it follows whenever you put a hand in front of it. It follows your hand. And then it's starting, uh, starting to work on experiment on how you can build squads. That is, that is lots of small robots that simply find out strategies all by themselves and work out. So the, the educational part of it was to find out how kids could uh, appropriate themselves this and find out how they can work with small swaps of small robots and start starting by building robots. Uh, it's not necessarily high technology. There's also low, lots of low technology. That is, how do you cut wood with a, a, a band saw, for example? Uh, you can also use a laser cutter, but not necessarily. And this is a place where you can find out uh, what are materials, how they react. Uh, when, you ha when you design a plan, it's uh, totally virtual. It's behind the screen, behind your computer. And when you start doing things, you find out that, well, wood is wood. It starts as a flat. Uh, things do not uh, get together very well. So all these kind of things is important for you to find out that with the regular tools, well, material, making concrete things poses lots of problems that you did not expect when you were totally virtual behind the screen. You also repair things. Uh, this is a hinge from a washing machine. Uh, everybody knows here, a lot of people are going to talk about industrial obsolescence, program obsolescence, uh, things, uh, tools, machines, cars, everything breaks after two, three, four, five years. And of course, you don't have spare parts anymore, so you have to buy something new. Uh, well, we don't like this much, so a fab lab, you know, fab lab anyway, we say, if we have a spare part that's broken, you can analyze it, you can build it again, and repair what you have in front of you, and save money, save energy, these kind of things. So recycling is, is okay, we prefer to talk about upcycling or repairing. If you show up in a fab lab, and uh, if you're interested in what happens in fab labs, you also come because you're interested in building unique objects. You want to have something done for you. Uh, Doug Searles, in a few a few minutes ago, was doing a presentation saying, well, saying we're all different. For years, we have been told you are all the same because the industry said you have to buy all the same things. And we're discovering that, no, we're all unique and different. So people will show up like to build unique objects. So we have some designers, but also people like you and me who are not designers to try to do, for example, uh, those are rings, for example. And we welcome almost everyone, you know. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, a few ministers around the table. And we have uh, a young guy called Elias, who uh, is part of the Fab Lab and has been there for the inception, since the inception of the Fab Lab. And Elias is 12. And he knows all the machines, everything that happens in the Fab Lab, and he's able to teach everyone how to use any machine that's available inside a fab lab. Laser cutter, 3D printer, but the simple saw or the, uh, the drill, the press drill, etc. This young boy is able to talk and explain everyone, replacing your fab manager, to everyone what's happening. And this day it happened that Elias was there and he explained to the Prime Minister how a 3D printer works. Well, that's interesting. So, enough with uh, 
Fab Labs. What did we observe? Um, so I don't have charts. Uh, I don't have anything uh, big uh, to show you with numbers, but I would like to share, because we share here is about sharing. So uh, I would like to share with you some observations, very humble, and I would love to get some information from you if it's possible also, because um, sharing is just, just me telling you what's happening. I would like to get some input, because I'm so here to gather some input, because I'm a curious guy. Um, what did you observe? So a Fab Lab is a play that is free, open to all, and as long as you share what you do there with the rest of the people. And we said, well, within a university, so this fab lab that you open has a kind of educational side. That is, uh, we need to have people coming in and share their knowledge and learn new things. And we didn't want to do it the traditional way with teachers. We didn't want it to do it the traditional way with somebody teaching and everybody being passive on asking for information to come to them. What we wanted to try was a way of exchanging horizontally information and making sure that everyone can contribute. So it's a, an uh, can not necessarily an economy of contribution, it's a pedagogy of contribution. Everybody knows something. Everybody has something to bring on the table. So uh, when we started and we wanted to create a fab lab, I think we thought that would work. That is, um, how can I say that? We were in the process of feeling in our guts that there was a need for something different, for people to be part of the process. We created the Fab Lab, and to our big surprise, a year after creating it, we had more than 4,000 people having coming into the, uh, into the Fab Lab. 4,000 people. When you open just every day from Monday to Friday, just the afternoons from one to six, maybe a Saturday once in a while. So it was a big success, 4,000 people. But I'm here to be honest with you. 4,000 people doesn't mean that you have 4,000 people who come back. Who comes back, really? 4,000 people means that if you look at the statistics, we have a core environment of visitors who come back regularly more than 10, more than 15 times, and we have 200, 300 people who come. Who come? Why? Because the place is free. People who make the, who have the energy to come and visit and see that they can do something, we tell them it's free, sit down, it's a very welcoming place, it's a warm place, uh, we share food, uh, we share lots of things. Why don't they, what do, why do they come back so often? And then we started to have a look at the statistics or so, or the emails we receive from people who say, I would like to come to the Fab Lab, it's a Fab Lab, I would like to learn. When are the courses? How much does it cost? What teachers do you have? Why on the Facebook page, on this website, on everywhere we talk about the Fab Lab, we say it's open, just push the door and enter. It's free. It's open to everyone. Come and share. Let's come and learn things. Let's come and share your knowledge. And what it was the most uh, interesting surprise to us after one year of experience was that people in their mindset are not ready for that. They are not ready for collaborative, flat, horizontal exchange of information. They still believe that you need a diploma. They still believe that you need a kind of pass to enter on being allowed to do something. They still believe that even if it's open, you need a proof, a virtual proof that is a diploma to say you are able to do this or that. And that for me is the major surprise. So we have lots of people coming and they're like you, they're curious. They come and they share because they are already free in their mind. They know that they can dare experiment they know that they can dare teach somebody. They know that they can be in this kind of empowering situation, but there are a small margin of the population. I would say there are more than less than 10% of the people who visit us. So what is happening? Is that we need to hack the system so that people feel empowered and understand that they can be free. 
they need to push the door and feel empowered. So what we are doing, we are hacking our own system and we are creating deployments, which is the opposite of what we wanted to do originally. Originally, it's free, it's open, it's coming. And when you look at the reluctance to enter, what we are doing is creating deployments, which is stupid, really stupid. So creating those deployments is a way of teaching people that, guys, you don't need fucking diplomas. That's <laughs> that's a good conclusion, Laura. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I just propose, sorry, Laura, I just propose a two-minute Q&A, and then we have that's to start. It. So uh, if you want to have a quick Q&A, because I'm here to share information, I would love to know if you have these feelings, and if, if you are a stranger from Europe, anywhere in the world, I'm keenly interested in having your feedback. Because I need this exchange of information to know if we are right, if we are wrong, because this is an experiment. We pay for all this. Yeah. Uh, the Fab Lab is a part of the university, so university offers the, the room, the place, everything. We have a technician who is paid by university. We have a foundation of the university, which got some sponsors originally to bring the initial money to start and kickstart it to get the machines. But after that, now we have a business model so that we do teachings. We have professional courses. And here we teach innovation, we teach uh, development, et cetera, et cetera, on this pay for the bills and make sure that we stay in balance. We're not making money. We're not there to make money at all. We're just there to be free and open to everyone. So we're finding a business model so that we remain free and open to everyone. We don't, for example, we don't offer materials. People come and pay for their materials. We don't have money for that. But we offer plastic, we offer the small pieces of wood they can start working on, and once they know that they can build something, they buy the real material, and we provide the rest, the community, the machines, etc., etc. Thank you very much, Laurent. <laughs>